they are embedded with human genetic information. And therefore, the leather produced out of those skin cells, the human leather actually produced out of those skin cells, it's embedded with the genetic information of a specific individual. So as I said, the process to obtain this type of um, material combines the use of the technique called the extinction, which is, the, uh, which is essentially a technique that allows you to extinct a uh, disease uh, genetic code, uh, tissue engineering technologies, and standard leather tanning techniques, which are already present in our current commercial market. And just to uh, explain that, well, the procedure was never carried out from the beginning to the end. Several points between the procedure were tested, although uh, different parts of this type of procedures exist, already exist today in different laboratories around the globe, which means that if they will be to combine today, we will have quite a similar product right away. So within the project, our day for this is my showcase, I created three different uh, leather pieces, which you can see above, and they all mimic the uh, characteristical changes that the human skin undergoes in the cycle of its lifetime. So for instance, one has a tattoo, the second one uh, has moles and freckles because it goes to the research with, uh, about the TIR gene, which combines melanin together, and the third one speculates on the option of uh, the leather being able to sunburn. And the reason for doing that is because I, well, to uh, enable the, uh, the visitor to still uh, have this type of human relationship with the object itself, but also to showcase the actual source of the material. A second part of the project was also included me filing for a patent application. And this patent application, if it would be granted, will allow me to, to obtain ownership over a person's uh, DNA, which would be embedded in a specific product, which we called a leather-like material. And just to highlight the, uh, the main reason for applying for the patent is that even though I'm presenting you with a speculative scenario, this patent showcased that it, the project it, it's actually still very much applicable to our current commercial market, and it's also set within the uh, legal boundaries of our system today. And just to get it out of the way, probably the most notorious aspect of the project was that I speculated on the use of uh, Alexander McQueen genetic information, and there are several reasons. Well, the most obvious would be because I'm setting everything up uh, around the luxury uh, industry. It was obviously uh, uh, quite a clear path to use a big, a gigantic luxury name. But then there are also other parameters. The second one would be that I wanted to showcase that even a person or even a brand that has a huge intellectual property and personal property protection could be affected by genetic exploitation. And the third one, it's a more practical one. It's actually being able to acquire um, the genetic information from a source. So, for instance, Alexander McQueen used his hair locks in the first two collections when he saw it into the labels of his clothes. So, straight after the project, there was a huge media frenzy. And, of course, the media didn't project the project as a critical and speculative project, as it was desired probably by me, but it was projected with a commercial agenda. And you can imagine how frustrated you can be as a designer when this happens. It's also fair to say that there was quite a bit of hate going on towards me because obviously it was quite a provocative idea that was put forward. However, what I noticed then, obviously after calming down my nerves, <laughs> I noticed that even though I was receiving all this hatred, the project actually achieved its purpose. It was generating a debate 
around uh, uh, between two poles that were considering the, uh, the technology in a different way and it was creating a buzz and people were starting to get engaged within the project. But even more surprisingly was the shift, the quick shift of mentality of the general population. So after the initial shock factor wore off, which was about two weeks after I launched the project, I could see how people were shifting the boundaries of what they find acceptable and they were starting actually to promote the project. Even more surprisingly is that several institutions that previously didn't have didn't want to have nothing to do with biotechnology and weren't supporting it at all, actually saw the potential more ethical application of this type of technology and therefore begin to promote it. So the Pure Human Project gets usually also promoted for its sustainable agenda. Although I still don't feel quite comfortable advocating this uh, um, this side of the project and the reason being because as I explained before uh, within the process I also stated that I would use standard leather tanning techniques and those tanning techniques happen to be one of the most polluting and non-sustainable techniques within the fashion industry so until this issue is resolved I do, do not categorize the project uh, as a sustainable one so this ability to critically reinterpret and reanalyze my work uh, put me on a forefront of advocating the use of speculative and critical design in the setting of bioengineering as well as in the luxury industry. And I could see how this interest and how the va validity of this type of work is slowly getting accepted by big institutions that I now colla collaborate for. So they're trying to set speculative and critical design as a part of their f what they call future proofing strategies, which means that they are slowly making small changes in a shorter amount of time to achieve the future needs and requirements of the general population in a lo longer time frame. And what I do usually advocate when it comes to that type of setting is essentially not to just uh, keep on doing uh, new materials and keep on uh, bringing up new ways of productions because we are therefore just creating an unsustainable environment itself because we keep on adding more and more stuff to our environment that we don't actually need, but maybe looking back and see how we can repurpose some of the, um, some of the uh, pr uh, procedures part of already existing technologies. Which brings me to my second project that essentially speculates on the reuse of the uh, technology that they currently use for the extinction. So the project is called the Phylogenetic Atelier Project and it was done in collaboration with the institution called Revive and Restore, which is an institution based in California that is trying to de-extinct several extinct animals. So therefore the project is showcasing how to use, utilize part of this technology for a commercially viable product. So essentially create extinct leather. So one of the reasons they have several different species that they are trying to de-extinct, but the whole project was set on, the, uh, on their passenger pigeon project. And the reason for doing that is, well, the first one is because it is their template project, which means that it's more far ahead and it is used for all the other de extinction projects they are trying to use. And the second one was the decision was based when they shared with me this timeline that you can see right now. So if you look closely, you would see that the release of the first flock of the passenger pigeons, which have now been extinct for 150 years, would be in 2035, which is really soon, less than 20 years, which makes the project so permanent now. So essentially the Phylogenetic Atelier project, which is done as a commission for Science Gallery Dublin, showcases the merge of a, a museum environment, an artisanal leather glove shop, and 
obviously a bioengineering laboratory. And the aim of the project is to showcase and make people aware of the possible implication that might arise when you try to bring back to life ancient, ancient DNA. So essentially, if we look at how we will uh, inc incorporate this type of procedure into our everyday life, we need to be aware of the shift of the biodiversity that the, the extinct genes will cause. It's also fair to say that bringing back extinct genes, uh, when we, even when we are, we are talking about the material that we are trying to de-extinct or an entire organism, we need to be aware that we are essentially producing a fake copy of these organisms. Because if you go to the science of epigenetic, uh, we will understand that uh, Asian DNA it's not restricted just to DNA, but there is also implications from the environment that create an original species. So talking about fake and about bioengineering technology, I would like to just showcase you my current project, which is still considered is still in sketches. That means it's in development. <laughs> uh, and this is called the Self Donor Project. And it's a collaboration between uh, Guy's Hospital, King's Hospital London, and it's a commission by Science Gallery London, which, by the way, just reopened its doors. <laughs> so the project, it's, it's, well, it aims to highlight the fact of how fake some of the news when it comes to biotechnology are. And essentially, it plays off all out of this utopian scenario that is presented to the public when we can just 3D print our organs and there is an overabundance of human organs in the future. First of all, obviously there is a lack of understanding of how this procedure works because obviously the printing human organs is quite a hit, but the project is still very much focused on now and what can be done in, a, in the uh, time frame of 10 years, which is why the research is based on what is called mini organs. So essentially, uh, think about it as biological bypasses. So it also aims to showcase that even though we are presenting with this beautiful utopian scenario of the overabundance of human organs, we still need to realize what this might cause. And Essentially, what I speculate of that this, uh, this uh, overusage of this technology might cause, it's the commercialization of the human body. Essentially, viewing uh, flesh tissue as a product. And this obviously comes with the commodification of genetic information. So again, uh, the project it's set as a merge together with uh, a bioengineering laboratory, this time a bigger one, and a an, um, tailoring workshop. And the reason for that is because within the project, I speculate of new job roles that this merge will create. And uh, essentially, this new job that I called uh, um, or, uh, how did organ tailors. And the merge comes from the fact that the procedure to actually um, 3D print an organ, it's a really similar one to the, uh, to the way of how tailoring works. So essentially, the project speculates on re-educating tailors in order to be able to produce human organs. So this is just to finish off. You will probably notice that there is a red line across all of my projects. And essentially this red line goes that I try to always reevaluate who should take ownership over genetic information and who should be entitled to set our regulation, uh, sorry, to set what we as a society find acceptable. So with that, I would just like to, uh, to leave you guys with a thought. If in the future or even now we can design life, essentially we can design living tissues and living organisms. If we can do that, does it mean that we should? Thank you.
I was going to ask in Spanish. Do okay. I just ask it in English? Spanish. In English? I'll, or just, in I'll do both in case people don't understand. Uh, just the patent application process in uh, the UK, um, as far as the other patent markets are concerned, like uh, with a reference to the United States, what's more, more or less like a timetable and then uh, the price of, of something like that for oh. a patent? The price is quite expensive. Actually, you have to f file separately for each individual state and for each uh, individual country. And the time frame can be quite prolonged. So I filed a patent application about two years ago. And uh, yeah, it lasted about two years. But I, uh, well, it's a complicated thing. But I actually um, stopped the patent application because I want to do some changes to it. But it, it sh can take even more than, like, I think, four years in order to be accepted. And then costs, more or less? Ha well, I, I fortunately didn't get to the stage where I could needed to cover it for the UK, but I know it's at uh, the time rate. I don't want to lie to you, so I should probably check this type of information, but you do it each for each individual year and for each individual country. So. Thank you. Eh, yo voy a preguntar en, en español. Eh, de tu primer proyecto, eh, creo que no, no lo acabé de entender por completo. Este, la piel con la que hiciste la bolsa, la chamarra y todo eso, o sea, no, como de, el material genético lo combinaste como con algo para, como para que creciera y después hacer ese producto o lo sacaste como de algún ser humano y entonces tú tienes como la patente de su ADN. Es que no, no, lo, entendí, no lo terminé de entender. So the, yeah, I can, uh, so the uh, product that you, can, that you see, they are not done by the material. They are speculation of how, the, how it could look and, um, yeah, well, how this type of material could look. In, a, in that setting. How you do it is you can extract genetic information and then embed it into skin cells and in the lab you're growing by tissue engineering technology. This is how it should be done. As I said, we didn't carry the procedure all the way through because it is a super expensive procedure and it requires high-tech labs for doing that. We tested several of the pathways and consulted with labs that actually do that in order to see that the um, material can be done by that procedure and yeah if to if it would be I usually get asked if it would be applicable like in terms of a larger scale we just must produce this type of material and my answer would be no and it's because of the time and um, cost efficiency this is as I said a luxury well it's a it was developed as a provocative project, but it, it would be a luxury, a complete luxury object, as obviously uh, just growing human skin is quite uh, expensive in comparison to when it comes to yeast or other types of materials. Um, hi, uh, I just uh, have like two comments. I think that um, if we start to, I don't know if in the medical or in the genetic world exist that, well, already exist, that they are making like real organs with a a DNA or I don't know. But if I start to think about that, um, I think that for people who has this uh, diseases that are really like uh, they are taking out their lives. I think that it could be a, an, a good uh, mm -hmm. option for them. But in the other side, I think that it's not the best way because it's not like for a commercial, like start to com to make commerce with organs and all this, just to have like a luxury product or something really exotic. I don't think that that can work, but in the other side, I think that that could be a really good option, but it would be for sure really expensive and... 
probably just a few would be able to 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 pay for that. And I don't know. I mean, yes, I agree with you. In terms of the diseases part, I completely agree. And it's also the benefit of uh, actually, uh, if you could grow or buy, uh, bioprint an organ like that, you essentially eliminate the, um, uh, well, eliminate when the, uh, the person can reject the organ when it, it's obtained from another donor. So essentially for that, it's way better. The problem arises when people are promoting that we will be printing whole hearts that, that people could like just take in and that's quite unrealistic because we're still unable to print different tissue to print an organ such as that that will be alive. This is set in a far future that it's even farther than 100 years. But what I do promote is the use of this type of technology for simpler organs or for mini organs. So when I say like let's think about it as biological bypass, I mean that you create an organ that it doesn't have to look like an organ, but it is um, it covers just the the per like it covers just one of the functionality of the organ. So essentially, the functionality that the patient's, uh, for instance, heart doesn't perform anymore and you apply it on it like a bypass. So that's it. However, to get to the point, it's, uh, I think also it doesn't just imply that this will be a luxury product. It could be in all the hospitals around the world. The problem is when you start to differentiate the quality of the organs based on the, uh, on the budget that the patient has. And there you introduce the product part, which will still make it, make it quite unfair. Uh, hello. Uh, um, why did you choose uh, genetic, human genetic material? Because I heard about uh, many projects that use uh, um, waste from several industries and they make a biotechnology transformation in order to obtain new materials for clothes and uh, luxury materials. Why did you choose uh, uh, human skin? Specifically human. Uh, well, based first because I wanted to highlight the fact of biotechnology might change the, war the way we look at the human body because we can finally see human body, for instance, for the materiality of it, rather than the emotional attachment we have with it. The emotional attachment comes from, because when we think about human materials, we also think about suffering, sacrifice, etc. Well, if you remove this factor and just produce it in the laboratory when no one suffers, and it, is, it becomes suddenly a completely new relationship that you have with the human uh, tissue. So for instance, if you were to hold a material that is grown in the lab a human, with a human source, it doesn't look anything like epidermis that you're seeing on my skin now. So if we just look at, for instance, the characteristic of this material, we can start to have another, a different relationship to it. Thank you. Um, just one more question. On some of the lab tech te techniques, I know some are proprietary, but are there any, um, after a lot of the research, some of the protocols, um, were there some long established protocols that you kind of used to guide y'all in doing some of the lab work? Or was that kind of outsourced to a lab that already had their protocols established as far as growing some of the materials? So the research was done as a collaboration with actual bioengineers who has, have the labs. Usually it was in the context of an academia where most of the, let's say, experimental research happens. So essentially they, uh, I was able to engage within the labs, but they were guiding the whole protocol, obviously, because of the expertise they had. Okay, thank you. Hola. Hey. Bueno, hace un momento hablábamos del de diseño también y principalmente del calzado para ver lo de los materiales para fabricación que utilizamos. ¿Qué tan viables eh, tú ves que pueda ser o 
Bueno, creo más bien que puede ser más fácil que se pueda lograr esto que estás pensando tú con animales para replicar pieles de animales o los animales exóticos como platicábamos, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, ¿cómo ves tú esta parte de, de, de esos materiales para evitar que sean directo del de, de animal, ¿no? Como decíamos, sin matar al animal. Uh, yeah, I get, I get this question a lot. <laughs> why don't you do it with animals? So, essentially, uh, the reason why I specifically didn't do it with animals is because I wanted to highlight the critical aspect of the project. Because, just to think about it, if it would be animals, everyone here would find it acceptable. Now that it's humans, that's how like the provocation sets it up. For instance, you would also, this wasn't set as a project that would be actually replace what we already have, because this type of project is still too expensive to do so. I also have problems categorizing bioengineering product, especially when we talk about leather. I like to call it leather-like uh, material, is just because, because of the fact of uh, the implication of what, it, what it's leather, like the definition, combines with the source, obviously, and the production. Well, this is produced in a totally different way. So, essentially, these projects were never meant to substitute or present an alternative, but they were more aimed to showcase how our mindset can be completely shifted within, uh, with, uh, within the future because of the totally disruption of the production systems that we know. Wait. <laughs> sé que tu proyecto sí tiene que ver con lo que nosotros percibimos de nuestro cuerpo como humanos. Pero creo que lo que estás planteando tal vez pueda tener más implicación a corto plazo con respecto a a materiales que podamos sustituir ¿no? dentro de la producción de estos eh, productos de lujo. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> wait, I can hear myself in Spanish. <laughs> I need to <laughs> remove that. So, as I said, well, if you would be to look at how to create actual materials that would have a longer term application, you wouldn't use an animal or a human source in either way. The reason being it's because obviously they're too expensive to do. You would essentially use a yeast source, for instance, just for the producing. This, as I said, even in a short term, it was meant to generate um, a debate around the usage of this technology and for us to ex uh, actually assess if we even want to go as farther as to use it for production as uh, as we want. Also, just to highlight my view on that, a lot of the times bioengineering gets promoted as this is the technology that will replace our current production system, which I don't believe so. I am a huge advocate of the coexisting of those type of technologies. And that the reason being is if you just think about like completely repurposing, um, let's say, uh, the leather industry with bioengineering leather, you would have, there will be so many, not just financial application, um, implications, but also uh, totally disruption of the system. You will have to re-educate all the workers, change all the institutions. And what is even more horrible, if you think about it, you will lose the craftsmanship and the traditions that relates to that type of um, uh, well, uh, to that type of industry. That's why I don't advocate my project as alternatives for that, but I use it as a platform to generate a critical thinking about the use of those type of technologies. <laughs> 